Let me ask you this question. And when I say the word family, what comes to your mind when you hear the word family? And that depends on your experience with family, doesn't it? Right? So when I say family, instantly you automatically think something. Pro probably not what your neighbor's thinking, and it's okay because your neighbor may not have had the same experience that you had. But family, when I think about the word family, uh, family provides us with, first of all, our purpose. Right? That's our purpose. Our identity is found in family, whether that's good or bad. Uh, second of all, family means support. Uh, we give and we receive support. You draw strength from family. There are times when you need your family around you. And there are times when you just need them to go in the other room and leave you alone. But family also means shelter. It's a shelter, if you will, from the world. You know, you can come in out of, you come in out of the world and you come home to family. But also it means opportunity. Opportunity to grow, to develop, and to be who you be and to become what God's called you to become. Opportunity, and sometimes that means that you have to go out from your family. In my case, that's exactly what it meant. And I think about that a lot lately. It's too late now, I mean, you know, it doesn't really matter now, but I never even thought about it. I just couldn't wait to get out and follow the plan of God for my life, which took me away from my family. And that's just the way it works, isn't it? Because family ought to be there to support you, to encourage you, and to challenge you, really. So no matter where we go in life, no matter how far we go, uh, whether or not we ever become everything God's called us to become, we will always be a part of our family, right? Okay, so three defining statements through the last, well, 25 years of ministry, and really it's defined uh, the ministry here for me, um, and it was a, a fundamental or a foundational statement. The very first thing that God had said to me, I remember, and this is just me talking before we get into a message here, uh, so it's the precursor, if you will. I remember the very first thing the Lord said to me as I was asking him for a message for this new family that I was a part of, this new family of faith, a message in this strange and foreign land. You understand, I'm not from the Midwest, so the Midwest is, at that time was very strange and foreign. And what would be the word that I should bring to this family of faith, Lord? What is it that you want me to say to them? And I needed something, and I took time to wait on him and pray, and then he spoke to me, and, he, and I remember him saying, just tell them that I sent you there to love them. Period. And then he said nothing else. And I went, oh, yeah, but can I get like a chapter and a verse? Can I get like three points in, in my, you know, because back in the day, you know, I was used to having 25 pages of notes. And you know, some of you may remember that. I mean, I just read my notes because that's just kind of me. You know, I didn't want to mess nothing up because I, I had good notes and I took time to make some good notes. Um, but when he said, just tell them I sent you there to love them, I thought, man, I don't know how far that's going to go. Uh, sure, I get up there, that takes, what, half a second? And then we're done? Okay, dismiss, go home. But that's not what happened that day in church. And Jeff would remember because Jeff was sitting there. What happened that day in church is people began to weep. And then just this sweet spirit descended on the place and it was amazing. It pays to obey God. You don't have to understand. It may not be what you thought. Well, this church ain't what I thought it was going to be. Well, is this where God put you? Then you stay put. Is this, is, is this what you're supposed to be doing in life? Then you stay the course. You don't think about leaving and unplugging. You just stay and do what God has called you to do. So tell them I sent you there to love them. Okay, great. And that was wonderful. I'll never, ever forget that moment. And that's exactly what our church needed at that time. It was a wounded, hurting church. So basically then, I get into the book, I can come up with something for you. Because you deserve to be taught his word. That tells me that some of God's people aren't being taught the word. And you know that that's true, that... You go, you, you know, it just depends on what circles you run in. You know, sometimes you get little happy pep speeches and at a boy, at a girl, and we're all winners and we have little lessons from Mayberry, 
you know, or Rocky Balboa or something. You can, you can come up with good lessons from any movie if you want, any TV series. But you deserve to be taught the word of God. You don't need little lessons from Mayberry RFD. You can watch Mayberry yourself and come up with your own lessons. But I'm going to stick with the word of God. So no matter what happens, whatever comes next in this world, no matter what happens next in America, no matter what this year brings, I'm going to love you and I'm going to teach the word of God to you. But wait, there's more. The third thing he said to me, and I remember this came at a very pivotal time uh, because I was trying to fire myself and go elsewhere. Uh, usually when your favorite team does terrible and they don't bring home the championship year after year after year after year after year, normally you get rid of the coach. You fire the guy at the top, right? Well, that's, that's a strategy. You got to get rid of the guy at the top, bring in somebody else. How come? Why is that so important? Because as the head goes, so goes the body. So if you got problems, you got to look to the top and say, hold on, let me check this dude out. And so I thought, well, we got problems here that I can't seem to overcome and I can't seem to break through to the next level. So maybe I should just fire myself and move out of here. And the, <laughs> the Lord said to me, love sent you there. The remnant keeps you there. The remnant keeps me here. So I, so I started focusing in on the remnant. I started focusing in on the remnant, not what wasn't happening, what, what, not what we could not accomplish. I wasn't focusing in on what wasn't happening, what we couldn't accomplish, the fact that we don't have the praise and worship team up here that I've always envisioned because they're out touring somewhere. But I started focusing in on the remnant and said, wait a minute, I'm going to focus on the remnant. I'm going to focus on the ones that are faithful, that are here, that are hungry, that love me and I love them. That's been my philosophy since. So are you really worried about whether the church grows or not? I ain't worried about it at all, because you're here. You're my focus. Would I like to see more people here? I'd like to see three services every Sunday. I'd like to see this parking lot so packed you can't even, people are parking everywhere, in the grass, on the roof, everywhere. Amen. Come in by helicopter, rhinoceros, whatever, however they get here. Because I know what we have here. We have the word of God and we have the spirit of God. And God's people deserve to be taught the word of God. They don't need little happy little lessons. They don't need civic lessons and protests and waving flags and banners everywhere. We don't need that. We got one banner over this church and it's the green, white and red, the Italian flag. That's it. <laughs> So those are the three defining or foundational statements. And then the Lord gave us our little summary, if you will, a little moniker, a, a, a statement where we say building faith for life. That keeps us connected to the foundations of what we're supposed to be doing is building faith for life. Because the Bible tells you that the just shall live by faith that you cannot please God without faith, and for by grace are you saved through faith. So faith is a pretty important subject regardless of what people want to tell you. If you're not growing in faith and building and developing your faith, something's wrong. But we have happy lessons and we all feel good when we leave church. But is it building your faith? Well, I just feel better. See, because when the moment of crisis or the storm of life comes to you, it's the foundations that will keep you strong and steady. And you'll be able to persevere and, and you'll be able to overcome. My faith is the victory that overcomes, so I want to keep my faith in check. My education isn't the victory that overcomes. My cologne isn't the victory that overcomes. Maybe you might smell like a million dollars. But it's my faith that overcomes. My faith is the victory that overcomes. And so there are some things that are foundational or fundamental that we're never going to go away from. First of all, family is everything. And so I look at this church as a family. I'm not into the mega church scene. I don't do that. You lose the connection. And then you just become a professional pulpiteer. You just show up, you preach, and you hit the road. And then you go to the country club all throughout the week. 
I mean, I don't know about you, but that's, my, that's how I feel about things. Is, and if I'm wrong, God will have to show me. But I, somehow or other, I look at Jesus as the standard. and I say, you know, there's a reason why Jesus only picked 12 and hung out with three. You do understand that Jesus primarily spent time with Peter, James, and John out of that 12. And he knew one was, was going to betray him. He knew the thief, uh, Judas, right? He knew that was going to happen, and Jesus never even made a big deal of it. But yet he hung out with the small group. He poured himself into a small group. And look what that group did. Look what that group did 2,000 years later. We're, we're still preaching the same thing. We're still teaching the same thing. We're still operating in the same Holy Spirit. We are still a family of faith. And your shepherd or your pastor is still here to love you. Because if, if you love your sheep and you're not abusing them and you're not looking at them as a stepping stone in your resume, you're going to take care of them properly. Praise the Lord. And you're going to stay the course with teaching the word of God because the word of God is the priority. Teaching you the word of God so you can take your stand when the storms of life come. Because I don't know about you, but you know, my mind can be a very entertaining place. And it is truly a battlefield. And sometimes a symptom comes and the first thing that pops into your mind is not biblical. <laughs> or somebody does something to you in traffic, crosses the yellow line and they almost slam into you because they're looking at their phone. I just want to come unglued on people. You're going to hazard my life, put my life at risk, put my, the lives of my loved ones at risk because you have to be on your phone. Are you kidding me? If there's, if there's an epidemic in this country, it's that. It's social media. So it is my intent and my goal to help bring out the best in you. That's that's all I'm interested in, because when you love your family, when you love people, you care about their best. It's not about you. It's not about my comfort. When you have kids and then grandkids, you gave up on that. That's a fact. You know, um, just thinking about it, you know, when, when the kids grow up and then all of a sudden the grandkids come, it's like, you know, it's, it's really not about you anymore. You know, you come home and you're ready to go sit down and chill out and then, and then all the kids are coming up like, oh, all right. Yeah, you know, Saturday, there's basketball games to go to now. You know, there's all kinds of things that mean, you know, it's like the, the sporting thing, man. It's like, I don't think we get Saturdays aren't my own anymore. <laughs> you know, but, but nothing is ever my own anymore. Uh, so you gave up that right. And so as a believer, someone who surrenders to the Lordship of Jesus, I gave up my right. It's all about, Lord, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? What have you made me? Who am I supposed to be? How do I discover this? So basically then, every one of us has a destiny to fulfill, a destination to arrive at. And it's not just, well, listen, listen, I'm too busy living my life, man. I'll get to heaven when I get there, but I got to just live my life and do my thing my way. And I don't care what anybody says. Well, that's not really the right attitude to have. You do have a destination, you do have a destiny, and it is the highest and best that God has for you. And so you may be tracking this way, but God say, no, I want you to go this way. And so it is a challenge. It's a battle. It's a tug of war, really. It's a tug of war with yourself. It's a tug of war with your flesh with your unrenewed mind and all the people that have poured things into you and spoken into your life. Some of those things, man, you got to cut them loose. You know, and one of the things that wrecks a lot of marriages is I hear people say, well, I have to be happy. You just need a good beating is what you need. You have to be happy. How about you just focus on your spouse, putting the needs of your spouse first and, and living for somebody else? That, that might work. Well, we don't do that nowadays because it's all about me. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, Winston S. Churchill, talking about destination, Winston S. Churchill is credited with saying, you will never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. 
every dog that barks. Whether that's good or bad, it, you, you can't stop and address every barking dog along the way. You'll never reach your destination. Well, how come, how come you didn't arrive when you were supposed to? Well, there were a lot of dogs along the way and I had to address each one. I had to give this one a piece of my mind. And then this one over here, this one demanded my attention, so I had to hang out with this one. Oh, this one over here, I, you know. There's all kinds of things that will keep you from reaching your destination. All kinds of things. Someone said, and I don't know who, who's, who can get the credit for this, but I wrote it down, I love it. Do you know what stands in the way of God's best? Everything else. Everything else in your life. You have to be wise. You have to understand that just because it's an activity that everybody else is doing doesn't make it right. Just because everybody else is saying we need to be doing this and we need to be doing that. I love when you get these news things that come... What you need to know about blah, 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 you ain't going to tell me what I need to know. Or how this guy overcame and what, you know, whatever. There's all kinds of leading things that they give you just to get you to click on or go there and read what they have to say. Open your mind and your brain up to the poison that they're going to pour into you. And see, if you're going to pour anything in, make it a steady diet of the word of God. But I want to show you something. <clears throat> I think it's really important because when this, when this came, when this got illuminated to me, it just, man, it changed everything. Psalms 23. Psalm 23. For as long as I can remember, and this is in every circle, every denomination, um, every brand or flavor of Christianity, everybody uses the 23rd Psalm for what? Funerals, but it's not a funeral psalm. It's never been, but yet that's what we've made it. Psalm 23. So we've got some foundation, we've got fundamentals that are going to hold us steady. No matter what comes tomorrow, no matter what happens next week or next month, no matter what 2023 brings, no matter what happens, <clears throat> we're going to stick with the Word of God, we're going to stick with each other, we're going to stick with the word of God. We're going to do our very best to bring the we're going to do our very best to bring the best up out of each other because that's what this is all about. It's about it's about use. It's not about me. We're going to stick with the word. We're going to understand that there is a destiny or a destination and that there are many distractions and you don't know what barking dog your neighbor is dealing with. So don't judge them. Don't criticize them. Anyway, the 23rd Psalm, it says this. You ready? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, or I shall not lack, or I shall not be in want. Man, that's a good place to stop right there. And woo! The Lord is my shepherd. I don't lack anything. So why would I speak lack? Why would I talk about lack? Why would I confess lack in any way? Why do people do that? Oh, I'm so broke. I'd never confess that. I'm not going to confess that. <clears throat> they try to get cute and clever. I'm so broke, I can't even pay attention. Yeah, okay, whatever. Verse 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. I'm on a fixed income. Who fixed it? God didn't fix it. Your cup's running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Hmm, I got bad luck everywhere I go. Well, the Bible says goodness and mercy are following you all the days of your life. I'm always in trouble. I never get a break. I never get the good deals. I never find a good parking space. Bible says goodness and mercy are following you everywhere you go. 
and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But I want to focus on one verse. There's much I could say, but we won't have the time. Verse five, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Now, how do you know that this isn't a funeral psalm talking about heaven? Well, there's no enemies in heaven. There are no enemies in heaven. That's how I know this isn't talking about heaven. And there's no shadows anywhere in heaven. But he prepares a table in the presence of your enemies. What's on that table? Everything that Jesus has bought and paid for. Verse, uh, in, in the contemporary English version, verse five says, you treat me to a feast, watch this, while my enemies watch. Good news says, you prepare a banquet for me where all my enemies can see me. Everything the word of God says that you have, that's what he sets that table with. And he does it right in the presence of your enemies. The enemies are the barking dogs. And Christians are so busy addressing the barking dogs and worried about the enemies and praying, God, will you do something about these enemies of mine? And God is saying, why don't you just focus on what's set on the table? Instead of wasting your time addressing everything that's wrong, instead of wasting your time trying to get God to do something about this over here, listen, the enemies are always going to be here, guys. They're always going to be here. I'm sorry. That's just the way that it is. That's part of living on planet Earth. You do know that, right? It's no different than the evil that lurks out there as, as crime. You do know that there's certain things you shouldn't do, right? You shouldn't go certain places, especially as a woman. There's certain places you shouldn't be running around to by yourself, especially at night in Rockford or Chicago. It's not wisdom. How come? Because there's evil out there. So do we spend our time worrying about the evil, praying about the evil, trying to do something, or do we just focus on the business at hand and say, listen, I, I got to go shopping. Okay, I'm going to go during the daylight hours and I'm going to avoid certain parts of town. That's wisdom. But you don't have to run your mouth and complain about it. You just go. Unless the Lord tells you not to. And he's, he's got this table set for us with everything that you could possibly need. And there are Christians who are more interested in the evil, more interested in the enemies. And they're not taking what belongs to them. And you're wondering why God is silent. You're wondering why your prayers aren't getting answered. You think God hasn't answered your prayer, but 2,000 years ago he answered it when he sent Jesus to the cross. 2,000 years ago, Jesus himself took your infirmity. He bare your sickness. He carried your pain away. He was made to be sin. You know he was a sinless substitute, right? But he took on your sin and your burden. And he hung on that cross. And he died a terrible death. And we have the nerve to accuse God of not hearing our prayer. We have the nerve to say, God, will you do something? <laughs> a lot of the things that you're experiencing and dealing with now are just the results of your choices. Hmm. God is always working to get you positioned with the right people in the right place to get you to a place where you can begin to go to where he wants you to go. But for one reason or another, you have decided, well, I can't do that because I'm committed to this. Or I have my principles. I got my principles. And I won't go back on my word because I said, I'll never come back to this church. Ew. People sometimes, they say things that make no sense whatsoever. And then they wonder why things unravel and come unglued on them. It's because you were disobedient and didn't do what God told you to do. God was trying to get you into a position years ago because he knew what was going to happen if you didn't. And then you want to stand get mad at God. You want to stand there with your arms folded and say, this faith stuff ain't working. I've been praying, nothing's changing. Well, you know, there is something called due season. There is a due season for things. 
in due season. If you continue to sow the wrong seed and cultivate and water the wrong seed, guess what? In due season, bad things come in your life. But on the other hand, if you continue to sow good seed and cultivate and water the good seed, good things will come in due season. Maybe due season hasn't come yet and you just need to hang on a little bit longer. But as long as you start and stop, you keep doing this starting and stopping thing. You start and then you stop. You start and you stop. It's like, hold on, give your seed a chance. Stay the course, be faithful, be consistent. Stick with the fundamentals and be consistent. Stick with the basics and be consistent. That was the message of the dream that I had. Stay the course, stick with the fundamentals and be consistent. Don't back up. Don't come up off of it. There is no, there's no more revelation coming. This is it. You got everything. You don't need more books. Chasing down, well, there's got to be some other books. What about these other books, these lost books? Let them stay lost. You don't need them. You got 66 books. That's all. You don't think God's big enough to see to it that you got what he wanted you to have? The problem is you haven't even mastered what you got. You're running around here, you're running around there, you're chasing this, you're chasing that, and you haven't even stayed the course and been faithful with what he gave you. I know I'm talking to somebody, just keep smiling. You're not going to have any enemies in heaven. There are no enemies in heaven. The enemies are here. This is where the enemies are. The enemies of doubt, discouragement, fear. The enemies there that are just barking at you. We have a reason. Pa Pastor, haven't you heard now? Haven't you heard what they just did? I don't care what they just did. It's all going to hell anyway. But not us. Now, I'm not advocating that you stick your hand, your head in the sand and just ignore it. There's some times when you got to take a stand and say, no, this ain't OK. You ain't just going to do this to me. I would hope that you have enough in you to know there are just some things that you don't just lay down and give up. So what are we going to do? What's a mother to do? Well, we're going to act like family. We're going to look out for each other. We're going to look out for each other. We're not going to criticize each other. We're not going to judge one another. You know, we want you to make as many family meetings as you can. When we get together and we serve up Sunday dinner here at 10 o'clock, we want you to be as, to as many dinners as you can. But if you can't, you can't. There's no criticism. There's no judgment there. Unless you start showing a pattern of you're missing an awful lot. I don't know where this cat is, but this person isn't showing up like they should. Well, now you have the responsibility to say, hey, we're, what's going on? Everything OK with you? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. No, you ain't fine. You ain't fine. And you keep missing, you keep missing Sunday dinners like this. Right. So family's going to look out for each other and take care of each other. Family's going to love one another and stand with each other. We're not going to judge and criticize anybody. You don't know what kind of a barking dog they're dealing with, and you don't know what's going on in their head. You don't know what, what may be overwhelming and overcoming them. So we'll stand with you. We'll encourage you. But we're, we're not just going to let you have your own way. Can't do that. Listen, you got to be here. You got to be here as often as you can. You got to participate. You got to be a part of the program. Right. It's not OK. It's not OK to say I'm a part of this family and I never show up any more than it's OK for you to say I'm a part of the team, but I never go to the training. Well, listen, if you never go to the training, you think they're going to let you play in the game. How does that work? You got to show up. You got to show up. And the secret is, is that when game time comes, you will perform under pressure just like you did during your practices. So that's why you stay with the fundamentals. Every single time you do it the right way. Every single time, if your mind is drifting, you snap yourself out of it and say, hey, attention, back here, back here, pay attention. Every single time, hey, he's reading the word of God. No side chit chat. Get out of your phone, put your phone down. That, that text message is not that important unless it's Jesus, and then I would suggest you get it. But if it is Jesus, please raise your hand and say, Pastor, you're going to want to hear this. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we're family. We're going to treat each other right. We're going to do each other right. We're going to stick with the fundamentals. We're not going to, get, we're not going to deviate. I don't care what happens out there. They can make everything in this book illegal and outlaw everything this book says. I am sticking with the word. That's what I'm going to do. I have to do it. If I give up on the word, I have just lost everything then there's no telling where you're going to end up. 
These things that God has put into place are there to keep you safe and together. And we are called to be a body. We are called to stay together no matter what happens.